Okay, so let's get started. Before we get started, just a couple announcements. First, a very important one, which is I've decided to move the midterm to be on Tuesday, October 21st, which is immediately after fall break. And the reason for doing that is I want you to be able, I want to be able to ask all the database related material on the midterm and have the final just be material from scripting languages. And if I held it on October 7th, I would have to limit the material to just the material up to entity relationship model, and I don't want to do that. I want to um, also not have to force you to remember database material in December. I mean, I want you to know it, but I don't want you to have to go back and have to bone up like, on it again when you haven't practiced it for like five or six weeks. Hopefully also, because it's right after fall break, um, it gives you a little bit, if you have to study over fall break, you can. Sorry if it forces you to stay over fall break. I apologize for that, but I think it's the best way to handle it. Second thing, I've been getting a couple comments about what some, some of you perceive as either the harshness of the grading on the homeworks or the pickiness. And I just wanted to say the first thing is you can always appeal your grade to the TAs. Please don't appeal it to me. They're the ones who graded it, and they're the ones that can hear your appeal and act on it. The second thing is the TAs are under immense pressure. We were only given 15 hours of TA support for this class, and we have 70 students. So the TAs have essentially 10 minutes per student um, on a homework assignment. So they don't have time to try to divine what minor syntactic problems you have or what's wrong with your logic. They just, there's like, they're often grading 10, 11, 12, 13 problems. So they have less than one minute per problem. They just don't have time to look at it. So if you feel like you've been, you know, graded too harshly or something, get in touch with them and let them know. But also, please understand their plight. And that's also why on the homework assignments, when I say we're going to cut and paste these things in the MySQL interpreter, we are. That's, that's the fast way for them to be able to check your queries. This is a programming course. And in another programming course, you wouldn't think of submitting a program that didn't compile and then arguing that you shouldn't have had all these points taken off because the program didn't compile, but that's essentially the argument that I've been hearing is I only had a few syntactic errors, it wasn't big, but what it meant is your query didn't even compile for the SQL interpreter, okay? So when we say we're going to test it by cutting and pasting things, we mean it. And um, I highly, I strongly encourage you to make sure that your queries work before you submit them. Now, I know sometimes, like on problem 7.11 in homework uh, 2, you couldn't test everything, like the create domain command would not um, even work in SQL. But you could at least check, like, the constraint and check queries because MySQL, while not actually executing them, it will syntactically verify them. So as much as possible, you can also help out the TA. So please try to do that because they are under a lot of pressure. Okay, those are the announcements. Uh, today, we are finishing up database design by going through a case study on normalization. And as you hopefully learned from the video lecture on Thursday, Normalization is a bottom-up design technique for databases. I personally tend to use the uh, top-down entity relationship model when I'm designing my relations, and then I use normalization as a check on that to make sure that I haven't missed anything. But it's useful to actually see how you would design a set of relations if you chose to do it completely bottom-up. And that's what we're going to do today. So last night, I posted the, uh, 
actually. I'll use this one. I posted a problem that I've given in the past, and it's from the hotel database that we've been working with this semester, except that instead of showing you the relations, we're going to show you how you would derive those relations from what is often referred to as a universal relation. So what you see in front of you is the so-called universal relation. And that's what normalization typically starts from. You basically take all of your data, and so all your attributes, and you put it in a single table. So that, in this case, we took bookings, guest information, hotel information, information about rooms, and we put it all in one gigantic relation, which is called the universal relation. And the goal of normalization is to decompose this universal relation into a smaller set of relations that have two properties. First of all, the lossless join property that you can rejoin those smaller relations to obtain the information that was contained in the larger relation. And the second is to maintain data integrity so that any integrity constraint that applied to that universal relation applies also to the smaller decomposed relations. And normalization provides a process to accomplish those two goals. The, so to start with, uh, the question gave you some information about the hotel database and about things you should make assumptions about. And the first thing it asked about is to identify different inconsistencies that this universal relation has. So basically, we want to identify insert, update, and delete dependencies. So what I'm going to do is just call on a few of you and see if you can't uh, identify or provide, or tell me what would be an example of each. So we're going to start with an insert dependency. And I'm going to go from the back of my uh, list today to see if Ying Zheng is here. So Ying, can you give an example of what an insert anomaly might look like? That's right. So if we insert a tuple into the table, it could cause some kind of problem with this um, enormous relation. I'm asking what is, there's two types of problems that we might encounter. One of them's obvious and one, well, one of them's kind of more obvious than the other one. And it, an acceptable answer is I don't know. Pardon? What problem could you, if you insert a tuple into this relation, it could cause some kind of problem with your database. The question is, what kind of problem could be caused? Okay, the fine answer. Okay, we'll go with Jonathan Yoder next. Okay, but the double booking errors, that's true, but presumably we could put a, that, that could happen even in the booking relation, right? We could accidentally introduce that type of error. So that's not really what I'm looking for here. So I'll move on. Next year, forget your name. Jerry. Okay, and what would be a problem if it wasn't in the database? So you want to add a new hotel to the database. Okay, so actually, you're on the right track here. So the first thing, actually, 
in doing that is to think about what is the primary key here for this relation. So what attribute or set of attributes, this is a booking, I'll tell you, this is essentially a booking. So the question is, what is the primary key for this relation? It could either be a single attribute or it could be a combination of attributes. Okay, so we'll write that down. So you're, you've got a superset of it. So we'll start with hotel number and guest number and date from and date to and room number. So you're right in the fact that these five together do uniquely determine the each tuple in the relation. It turns out you have a few too many attributes in here. So. Okay. Date two, that's right. Date two, you can get rid of. And yes, you can get rid of hotel number and room number. That is correct. Now you have it. So guest number and date from is going to uniquely identify it. So guest number by itself can't do it because a guest <laughs> might have multiple bookings, not on the same day. Might. And date from doesn't do it. The only way date from can be unique is if we're going out of business, okay, because we don't want to have only one booking <laughs> in our hotels on any given day. So hopefully we have multiple guests checking in on the same day. So neither by themselves is enough to uniquely identify it. But together, guest number and date from, in fact, do uniquely identify every tuple in that relation. I'll kind of let you convince yourselves of that fact. Now, since they're the primary key, since guest number and date from is the primary key, that means their values have to be non-null if you insert any tuple into the database. So now I'm going to come back to what you were saying earlier, which is we have a new hotel. Okay, let's say we just finished completing it, but we don't have any bookings for it, and we want to add that hotel. Let's say it's a Hampton Inn. We want to add it to this relation. So it's going to be an issue. And the question is, what is that issue? Well, you'd have to create the hotel number, and that's not a problem. We presumably have a hotel number. Exactly. So the problem is this thing requires me to have a booking, specifically because the primary key is a guest number and date from. Any tuple that I insert has to have non-null values for the guest number and the date from. So it means that I cannot insert a new hotel into this relation unless I have a booking for it. So either I have to just create a dummy booking, which isn't really good because I want it to identify real bookings, not you know fake bookings, or I can't insert it at all. So update anomaly one. So the first or I'm sorry, in the first kind of insert anomaly is that I cannot insert new hotel info without a booking. And the same thing goes for a room. If we add a new room for some reason, I can't add information about a room or if I have a new guest, but they haven't booked something yet, maybe they just um, joined our rewards program, I can't add them 
to the relation without having a booking from that guest. So there's three types of information, information about a hotel, information about a new room, and information about a new guest, all of which I cannot insert into this relation unless I have a booking. And that's considered an insert anomaly. Okay? So actually, that was the less obvious one. Okay? There is a more obvious one that we've been talking about throughout the semester. So for that, we have Yu Yang here. So Yu is another kind of inconsistency there. Okay, so um, Yu's answer was that if we have to change the name, say, from Hilton to Hampton, then we're going to have to change it in multiple places, not just one. And you are correct, except you have identified what is called an update anomaly. Okay, so an update anomaly occurs when we change existing information in the database. So you actually kind of skipped ahead. The next thing was an update anomaly. So an example of an update anomaly is if we change hotel name we must change it multiple we must change it multiple places or change it in multiple places and if we forget to change it in even one place we have an inconsistency in our database So we're going to go back, though, to an insert anomaly, which is what happens when you insert a new tuple into the database. And we have Julian jo Roche. Okay, great. Fine answer. Um, is Dimitri here? I don't think so. Uh, let's see. I Isaac here. Nope. Let's see. Is Alice Ann here? Yes. Not sure. Okay, that's fine. Uh, how about Nilu Ranjan? Not here. Christopher Muzan. Feel free to take a guess. <laughs> so, okay, so that is kind of like, yeah, that's kind of like, that's okay. I'll go next door to Daniel. Whoops, Kyle. Gosh, I'm bad, sorry. A little bit sleep deprived right now, Kyle. Right, so if you insert a new tuple, you're going to be potentially repeating a lot of information. Like if I have another reservation, say, for room 600 at the Hilton in San Diego, not only do I record unique information, which presumably is the guest number and the date from and the date to and the room number, but I'm repeating a lot of information. I need to repeat the hotel number, and I need to repeat the hotel name, and the hotel city, and the hotel zip, and the guest name, and the guest city, and the guest zip, and the room type, and the room price. Okay, all of that information is repetitious. And if I don't get every single piece of information right when I insert this new tuple into the database, then I've introduced an inconsistency. Like if I make a typo when I say Hilton and I say Y, H-Y-L-T-O-N, that's a mistake. Even though the hotel number was right, the hotel name is now incorrectly recorded. So the second one is that 
I could um, introduce inconsistent data and I actually said give an example so if this was an exam I would not like you to say it could introduce inconsistent data if this were an exam what I in fact would want you to say is something like for insertion anomaly you could give the example of not being able to not able to insert a new hotel unless I have a booking and you could also say could not insert a room without a booking or could not insert a new guest and the second thing would be an example of an insertion anomaly is you insert a new booking but misspell Hilton and hence introduce inconsistent information. Okay, and again, it could it doesn't have to be you misspell Hilton. The example could be you give the wrong price for the room, or you give the wrong type for the room, or the wrong guess you misspell the guest name. So it doesn't but when I say example, I want a specific example of what's happening. Okay. And we already have an example for the update one. So the example was, for an update example, um, I change the name from Hilton to Hampton Inn. And that means I have to do it in multiple places, or I must change multiple tuples. And if I forget even one, then I will have inconsistent data. Looks like I had a question. Mm hmm. Very good. So that's kind of the whole pro. Okay. So that's kind of actually, I'll tell you what. You kind of identified, just a second. I knew this would be tough, but you kind of hit on it. You actually just identified the issue with a delete anomaly, okay? Which is if you, for some reason, delete all the bookings associated with a certain room, now you no longer have any information. You lost the information, right? Or if you never, or you may have been prevented from inserting it in the first place, right? So either you were never able to insert information about that room, or if you were, if you inadvertently delete all the bookings associated with the room, then you lose all that information about the room. So as an example of a delete anomaly, I'll say if I delete all bookings, and it's not, so delete, remember in the homework assignment, you just may move it to an archival thing, right? It may be that as soon as the, you only keep current and future bookings in this relation, and you move all expired bookings into an archival database. Well, if no one's currently booked this room, you lose the information. So if I delete all bookings for a particular room,
then I lose all the details about that room. such as room type, room price, and room number. And you could give me another example. It could be if you remove all bookings for the Hilton, you lose all information about the Hilton. If I remove all bookings about a certain guest, such as BBZ, I lose all information about that guest. Okay, So those are the three types. You got insert, update, and delete. And it so happens that I had two insert anomalies, right? They're actually, in some sense, related to the other two, right? With insert, the first one is related to the delete anomaly. So the first one is related to the delete anomaly. So the issue is I can't get a new hotel into the database unless I have bookings associated with it. On the flip side, if I inadvertently remove, somehow got it into the database, but now I remove the last booking associated with that hotel, I lose all the information. So number one under insert is kind of the mirror is delete, and the second one mirrors the update problem, okay? Because I'm inserting a new booking. If I misspell any of the information that is already stored in the database, I've introduced an inconsistency which is kind of just like an update where I changed something already in the database, but I may forget to update every other tuple. So insert is kind of like it has all the delete problems plus all the um, update problems. So what we're trying to do is through normalization, we want to eliminate these problems. So the next thing, so in this question, what I was doing was, in, a, in effect, leading you through the steps that you use to normalize a universal relation. So the first thing you have to do is B, which is you have to ask, oh, good, I can't quite get it. But you want to ask what, okay, it's not going to give it to me. What are the functional dependencies for this relation? And for that, you go back to the assumptions about the data. So the first assumption is that the hotel number uniquely identifies a hotel's name and zip code. So basically, the first functional dependency is that the hotel number determines the hotel name. and the zip code. Pardon? That is true. Okay. I am sure. I'll do that now, and then I'll come back to it. In fact, I'm going to write it. I'm going to go back and forth. So here I'm going to write hotel number determines hotel name and hotel zip code. So that's, that's what number one gives me. Okay. 
So the second one says a zip code uniquely identifies a city for both hotels and guests. And again, I understand in the real world that's not true. Like the area code 37920, which I live in, is covers both um, Knoxville and great the city that's it, when you're going from here to Sevierville on 441. Seymour. Thank you. Yeah. So I could be either from Seymour or from Knoxville. But we will assume the zip code uniquely identifies the city. And it said for both hotels and guests. So this is a case where if you're kind of on top of things, you realize that you really don't need to say hotel zip code. It's like zip code is a zip code, regardless of whether it's for a guest or for a hotel. You don't really need to have two separate attributes, one called hotel zip code. Well, actually, in the universal, I take it back, in the universal relation you do in order to uniquely identify it. So we will keep that for the time being. So we have hotel zip code determines hotel city. And we have guest zip code determines guest city. So that's what number two gives us. It might help. It might help you if you actually keep it up in front of you because I'm just doing this off of my website. So the third one, C, says a guest number uniquely identifies a guest name and zip code. So guest number determines guest name and guest zip code. So you basically, you can just read off the functional dependencies in this case from the assumptions I gave you. In the real world, you would, of course, have to go out and interview people, look at uh, the forms the company has provided, figure these things out for yourself. But this is more, we're giving you a lot of this. So D says a room number and a hotel number uniquely determine a room type and price. So if we know the room number and the hotel number, we know the room type and the price. So there we have room number and hotel number determine room type and room price. And the last one says a guest number and date from uniquely determine a hotel number, a date to, and a room number. Okay, so we have guest number and date from. uniquely determine a room number, pardon, date two, uh, date two, and a hotel number. Now, there's one functional dependency in there that is not explicitly listed but you could probably infer from E. Okay, it's, it may seem a little like a redundant functional dependency, but it involves a different determinant on the left side. Remember, the determinant is the set of attributes on the left side of a functional dependency. So, guess number and what will also form a unique left-hand side that will uniquely determine every tuple. Date two, very good. So if you know the date two, presumably you're, you're not allowing overlapping bookings. So therefore, 
a, the same guests cannot be checking out twice on the same date or you'd have an overlapping booking. So you also happen to know that guest number date two determines a room, a date from, and a hotel number. And when you're doing this kind of exercise, it is in fact important to try to enumerate all possible functional dependencies. You don't just want to stop and say, well, I already got this one. This one's pretty much the same, so I don't need it. That's not true. You need both of them. You need to enumerate all possible ones because when you're doing your normalization steps, you need to make sure that all functional dependencies are accounted for because your functional dependencies define your integrity constraints. Remember we said two things that normalization does. Preserves lossless, it has a lossless join and it preserves integrity constraints. Well, in order to preserve your integrity constraints, you have to explicitly enumerate what they are. And what they are is exactly your set of functional dependencies. Yes? The, yes, so we call that a transitive dependency. So good question. The question was, is it not true that I'm missing a functional dependency? And that functional dependency that I appear to be missing is hotel number determines the hotel city. So there's a second rule, <laughs> okay? Not only do we enumerate all functional dependencies, we enumerate a minimal set that doesn't have any repetition, okay? This functional dependency is actually repetitious, and the reason it's repetitious is we can infer that functional dependency from the fact that hotel number determines hotel zip code and hotel zip code depend. So you're right, it's a functional dependency but a repetitious one. It's what we call a transitive function, de functional dependency. Since A determines B and B determines C, A must determine C. That's a transitive. So we don't include, we do not explicitly include transitive functional dependencies because they're repetitious. Okay, so we want a, the minimal set of functional dependencies that fully describes the integrity constraints. So it's a great question. It's, that's why we don't include that one, though. Everyone understand that? Because that's a pretty important thing. No transitive dependencies should be explicitly enumerated. Okay, so at least by my calculation, this is actually the set of uh, a complete set of functional dependencies. Okay. So once we have the complete set of functional dependencies, we can start doing our decomposition. Now in the lecture from Thursday, I talked about zero normal form and first normal form. So zero normal form was just a matter of taking um, data that might be several lines of data and making sure that they were separated into single tuples. So you went from um, zeroth normal form to first normal form when you both, well you put it in zeroth normal form when you made sure that every row was exactly one line. You couldn't have multiple um, pieces of information in the same row. And then you went from zero normal form to first normal form when you eliminated multi-valued attributes. So the example I gave in the video lecture was phone numbers. Every branch could have from one to three phone numbers. So you have two solutions for going from zero normal form to first normal form. You either have an upper limit on the number of occurrences of an attribute value, like in the case of the phone number for a branch, you can have at most three. So you can create that number of columns 
one column for each possible instance of the attribute. That's a horrible solution. You should essentially never do it. Okay? I know this from experience because it makes queries really hard. Like you say, give me all phone numbers associated with uh, branch 003. Well, now you have to say, give me all phone numbers where branch number equals B003. And you have to say, basically, select phone number 1, comma, phone number 2, comma, phone number 3, except maybe two of them are nulls. So now you get back, you know, one phone number, null, null. That's not really what you were after. Okay? So I've found that's a horrible solution. The much better solution is to remove the multi-valued attribute from the relation and put it off in its own relation. So you create, in that case, a relation that had branch number and phone number. So you take the multi-valued attribute, you remove it from the relation, put it off in its own relation along with the primary key. That gets you to first normal form. The relation, the universal relation I gave you for the hotel was in first normal form already. So to go from first normal form to second normal form, does anyone remember what the rule is for going from first normal form to second normal form? What kind of dependency we try to eliminate? What was it? Partial dependencies. So we need to eliminate partial dependencies. Okay, so a partial dependency is one where you have a primary key and it's actually the primary key consists of multiple attributes. And you have other dependencies where the left-hand side is a subset of those attributes. So let's see the primary key is ABC. If you have a functional dependency of AB determining D and E, then that is a partial dependency because the attributes on the left-hand side, the determinant, are a subset of the primary key. So we go from first normal form to second normal form by eliminating partial dependencies. So we go from first normal form to second normal form by eliminating partial dependencies. Okay, and then we have to know what a partial dependency is. A partial dependency is one in which the determinant, which is the left-hand side, is a strict subset of the primary key. So a full functional dependence, C is one that involves just the primary key. So we're missing something right now. Actually, we're not because we actually um, identified it early on. In order to go from first normal form to second normal form, we have to identify the primary key. Anyone remember what that primary key was? Guess number and date from. So we chose as our primary key guess number and date from. There is an alternative primary key, date two. So then alternative, so that, there's a candidate key called guess number and date two but we chose as our primary key guess number and date from, which is more intuitive. By definition, we are in second normal form. If we are in first normal form, okay, so here's a definite. So if a relation 
is in first normal form and its primary key, abbreviated as PK, is a single attribute. then the relation is in second normal form. Right? That makes sense? Because it can't possibly have a partial dependency. We said that the partial dependency has to be a strict subset of the primary key. Well, a strict subset of it would be zero attributes, which is impossible. Hence, if we don't have any issue if the primary key is a single attribute. So a huge hint for both the homework and the exam, whenever I ask a normalization question and I ask what is the primary key, you can be 100% guaranteed that it's not a single attribute because I'm not going to give you a question where it's already in second normal form. It defeats the purpose. So if you can only come up with a single attribute for your primary key, hunt a little harder. Okay? So in this case, no, nope, there we go. We have a primary key with two attributes. So we go back to our list of functional dependencies, and we need to figure out whether any of them appears to be a partial dependency. So can anyone point out a partial dependency? Which one? Yes, name, wait. Um, wait, let me number them. Two, three, four, five. Tell me a number. Okay, four. Right. This one is a partial dependency because guess number is a strict subset of guess number and date two. Are there any others? There can be exactly one other one, right? Because there's two attributes in that primary key. Okay? You can look. The only other possibility is there is one that says date two. And there is none. Okay? If you're looking at number seven and thinking that has, uh, I'm sorry, if you're looking at number six, that does have date from in it, but it also has guess number. That's a full functional dependency. Okay, so six is not partial. That's what we call a full functional dependency. That is the primary key. If you look, you'll not find any dependency on that list that contains only date from. If you also look, you might look at number seven and say, hey, that contains guess number. But that's not... Okay, a partial dependency in, is one in which the determinant is a strict subset. Okay, this, whoops, this is not a subset, right? It contains date 2, which is not in the primary key. So 7 is not a partial dependency. Our only partial dependency here is number 4. Okay, so what we do is... I don't really want to know. We remove the entire partial dependency from the relation and form its own new relation, which means that we end up with guest number as a relation that contains guest number, guest name, and guest zip code. So we take the, all the attributes, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and we put it into a new relation. The left-hand side is going to be the foreign key. So the left-hand side, or 
or the determinant is the foreign key. Well, determinant is both the, well, let me rearrange that. Okay. The left hand side is the primary key in the new relation. Okay. So that gives us, so this one, number one, preserves integrity constraint. Right, because we've moved all the attributes associated with that functional dependency into a new relation. So we must have preserved that integrity constraint. Okay. The second thing is that every attribute in the determinant is a foreign key. So every attribute in the determinant is a foreign key back to the so-called parent relation that we just removed it from. There's a foreign key, I'll say, back to or that references um, the parent relation. which this relation was derived. And this is the lossless join property. Because this ensures by including the determinant in the new relation we ensure that we can join this new relation with the parent relation and acquire the old relation. So it's a lossless join. Yes, Mike Mitchell. What exactly is the guest You're saying would guest name be a P? Are, are you asking, would guess name be a key or no? Guess name is not in the determinant. Only guess number is in the determinant here. Remember the, um, oops, come back. It, it, right, right. So the guess name and guess zip code were on the right-hand side. Guess number was on the left-hand side. The, the reason, by the way, that you don't have guess name as a determinant is that you can have two guests with exactly the same name. I think, Mark, are you the one who has exactly, or is it the you, Dave? I think it's you, David, who's, you have the same name as your father, right? So, as an example. So, in that case, it wouldn't uniquely determine things. Okay. So, basically, that is going to, this gives us a new relation. So this is one of our new relations. The other thing we do, we leave the determinant in the parent relation. So I guess really also as part of it, so let me go on and say, whoops, three, is the determinant remains also, I would say, also remains, also remains in the parent relation. So this also is necessary to preserve lossless join because it gives us something to join with. Okay, and four, the right-hand side attributes are deleted. Are deleted 
from the parent relation. Okay, and I don't feel like writing that all down, so instead I'm going to go to my handy dandy solutions at this point. Okay, and I'll make it bigger so you can all see it. Oh, good, very good. Wow. Wow. It's having trouble handling it. Okay. Let's change it from courier. Make it Cambria. That's eh, too. Calibri. Wow, it's really having trouble handling it. It's interesting. Huh. Okay, there we, for some reason, Microsoft Word's having an issue. Still having an issue. Okay. At any rate, here's our first relation. Guest info has guest number, oh, Okay, just a second. There's guest city in here, and let me get to that in a moment. Guest city also had to move. So let me get that. And then booking, you can see that it still has guest number right here, but we eliminate it. If you look in booking, we've eliminated guest name and guest zip. Now, the fifth thing I needed to say was that any attributes that are part of transitive dependencies also move. Also move to the new relation. Okay, so what happened is I moved guest zip code into the new relation. But guest zip code was in three, it determined guest city. So we also have to move guest city into this new relation as well. So in fact, We also need to have guest city here because it is part of a transitive dependency that involves guest zip code. So we start by moving partial dependencies out. Then if the partial depend if the right hand side of the partial dependency, if any of the attributes in the right hand side are the left-hand side of a transitive dependency, you also have to move the transitive dependency attributes also into the new relation. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Okay, so now we are in... I, but we don't have guest address. It wasn't so... Um, you're right, if we had guest address, but we, it's not one of our attributes. Okay, so now we're in second normal form. And if you remember, we go from second normal form to third normal form using what kind of dependency? Transitive. We use transitive dependencies to go... third normal form. So if we come back here, so transitive dependencies 
are attributes, let's see, how do we define them? Okay, so a transitive dependency. equals a dependency in which the not the uh, in which an attribute could be multiple an attribute on the right hand side of a, I'm going to say, of the dependency involving the primary key is the left-hand side of another dependency. Okay, so if we go back go back to here. Okay, six. And look at six. That gives us our depend uh, gives us a functional dependency that involves the primary key. And you'll notice that room number and hotel number right there, they form a dependency. So this one right here, I'm going to called TD for transitive dependency. It's like, yep, we'll get to it. There's, there's going to be some nuances. So if we look at number one, we are going to see, we think that it's a, yes, so number one is also a transitive dependency because of hotel number. Now, here's the nuance. So we see guest zip code going to guest city, but it doesn't appear in 6, right? But when we went to this new relation right here, Okay, this became a primary key. Guest number became a primary key determining these three things. And now in this one, we see, is it three, I think? Yep. If we go back here. So in our new relation, number three is a transitive dependency in our new relation. So not only do we look at the original relation, but we have to look at the new relation as well. Okay? So this is a transitive dependency. Now, we still haven't dealt with 2, and we still haven't dealt with 7, but we'll get to that. So we do the same thing with transitive dependencies that we did with partial dependencies. We move all the attributes in a transitive dependency into a new relation. So we'll now have room number and hotel number. 
and whoops, hotel number and room type and room price. So that was from function of dependency four that gives us one new relation. From one, we have hotel, whoops. Yes, yes, hotel number. From one, we have hotel number and hotel name and hotel zip code. And remember, we have to bring along any transitive dependencies, which is going to be hotel city. So when we move a set of attributes to a new relation, we also have to include any embedded attributes, embedded transitive dependencies. And there is such a dependency, which is from hotel zip code to hotel city. Then the, let's see. So we included, we've dealt with one, we dealt with four, and then three is going to also give us, so three is going to give us guest zip code and guest city. Okay, and now our other ones are coming down. So now the one we had just created becomes just guest number and um, guest name and guest zip code, okay? Because we eliminate it from it, guest city. And the original parent one now just becomes guest number and date from. And everything that's in number six. So that included, let's see, date two included, I believe, room number and hotel number, if I'm not mistaken. So that is what's left in the original parent relation. Okay? Now, the second part. We're not done. We have to recursively apply this rule to all of our relations that we got. So one of the relations we got was this one. And this relation is not yet in third normal form because it has itself a transitive dependency in it which is number two. If you go back here and you look at two, you see that we have hotel zip code determines hotel city. Okay? And you see that that is actually a transitive dependency that's embedded in our new relation. So we have to further break this one down into one that is hotel number, hotel name, and hotel zip code, and one that is hotel zip code, and hotel city. Okay, now you have, so get rid of this. This is a set of relations that are in close to third normal form. Okay, they actually are in third normal form, but there's a slight, Mark, I'll get to you in just a moment, but there's one, there's still one slight problem here. Okay, technically we have something that is in third normal form. Okay, in reality, we know that there's still a problem with inconsistency. There's two relations that are going to potentially contain redundant information between them. Just use your knowledge, common sense now. 
So. Exactly. So even though it seems that we're currently in third normal form, we know for a fact that guest zip code and hotel zip code are really the same thing. They're a zip code. And originally, in the original relationship, we, we had to have different... So if you look at the original relation, we couldn't just have an attribute called zip code because we had a hotel zip code and a guest zip code. <coughs> And they really represented two different things. But now, we, through our decomposition, the zip codes have gone into different relations, right? The guest zip code is in this relationship. And the hotel zip code ended up here. So it's no longer necessary to assign them unique names. We can, in fact, if we're smart, just call it zip code, right? And then we can get rid of one of these relations. We can actually get rid of it and just say zip code determines city. Now, that's just a common sense one. That's not something you get from mechanically applying the rules. That one is why they pay you the big bucks, okay, to be not a robot, but someone who can actually look at this afterwards and say, hey, guest zip code and hotel zip code are essentially the same thing, and since they're now no longer part of the same relation, we don't need to have two separate functional dependencies for them. We can now actually in each of the two relations that contain them, we can simply rename those columns zip code, and now we can have a single relation that contains a zip code in a city. That way we avoid repeating information. Okay, Mark. Okay, that's why I was kind of, I thought you might be. Okay, now there's, there's you can go further into normal forms. The book also has Boyce-Codd normal form, fourth normal form, fifth normal form. Here's what happens after you... So from first normal form to second normal form to third normal form, it's strictly increasing or it, it's, it's, it's not introducing any redundant information. It's actually just producing cleaner and cleaner relations. Once you go to any higher normal form, including voice cod, you actually can start reintroducing inconsistencies into your data. So above third normal form, it starts to become a trade-off. You eliminate certain kinds of inconsistencies, but you reintroduce other kinds of in inconsistencies, and so it's a trade-off. And since this isn't, if we were Doing a semester-long course, we would get into those other normal forms, but we're not. So this is all the time we have for that. The other thing, just quickly, you'll notice that we never dealt with dependency 7. Okay, That just wasn't included in any of the normal forms. But you will notice that... Number seven, if you take a look at our final set of relations, number seven is embedded in this relation right there. So we actually still preserved that integrity constraint. It's still enforced because it's still all the attributes associated with functional dependency number seven are in what remains of that original parent relation. So even though we never did anything with functional dependency seven, because it was a candidate key, you'll notice that when we're done, we still are enforcing it. And at the end of last lecture, I said there's a more general form 
where you would also eliminate dependencies on candidate keys. We're not going to worry about that in this course. Um, doesn't arise super often. So we're just going to, in this course, worry about eliminating dependent, partial dependencies that are on the primary key and transitive dependencies that come off of the primary key. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so Thursday we're going to start into the last topic of the database portion of this course, which is physical design, and we will be covering both um, indices and B plus trees and extendable hashing, which is something you may or may not have seen in 302. So you will see that on Tuesday, Thursday and Tuesday.